the, you know, of course there were always queer people living in Queens, but uh, in this paper I want to illustrate that they really became a political block voting force um, in, in the early 1990s as a result of several developments, which I'll go into. But um, again, queer people have always lived in Queens in the 1970s. Um, the community was oriented around uh, some gay bars in the neighborhood, Jackson Heights. There were various cruising places in Jacob Reese Park, in, in um, Orchard Beach in Queens. But again, not a coherent um, block community in, in many ways, in the sense that many uh, gay men and women in oral history interviews often commented that in the 70s, well into the 80s, they felt they had to live a dual identity. That is, they had to remain in the closet in Queens, but only, they could only really feel open in maybe particular spaces, the gay bars that I mentioned, or they would have to go to Lower Manhattan, Greenwich Village, where they could really feel that they could be their authentic selves. Remember Queens, 1970s, who's the most famous uh, resident of Queens? Um, in fact, it was a fictional character, right? Archie Bunker, the um, so-called lovable bigot. Uh, culturally conservative white ethnic communities in many of the uh, boroughs' neighborhoods. Um, remember the 1977 mayoral primary, the Democratic primary, got particularly nasty and homophobic between Mario Cuomo Ed Koch, Bella Abzug, and others, um, signs appeared in Queens, um, vote for Cuomo, not the homo, right? And um, really stung Ed Koch, who of course would go on to win and be, become a three-term mayor. He himself was closeted. Uh, there was, not too long ago, did you see this in the New York Times, a real expose about him remaining in the closet and how to remain politically viable in the 70s and 80s, he felt that he had to do so, but um, there, was many, there was much frustration and resentment for many gay activists in the city and others too because um, of the relative, his relatively slow response to the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. So there was resentment from folks like uh, Larry Kramer, the founder of ACT UP, and, and many others. It was a real heartbreaking article. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to go back and check out that piece. Uh, so the, the, front, the first image here, um, uh, this, is, this is an image of the first Queens Pride Parade in Jackson Heights, the neighborhood in June 1993, but I want to present a little bit of the backdrop here on how the community becomes a coherent political force by the early 90s. Uh, and it takes place against the backdrop of activism, of increasing activism uh, during the HIV AIDS crisis. ACT UP, an organization founded in 1987 by playwright and activist uh, Larry Kramer, um, felt that the gay men's health crisis in the city was too politically weak. We need a stronger force to um, push to coordinate a national policy on AIDS, um, to demand greater access to experimental drugs, to protest the high price of of uh, drugs such as AZT to protest pharmaceutical companies, to protest the Catholic Church for its, for its stance against safe sex education, condom distribution in schools, uh, against abortion, and, um, and other issues. So ACT UP emerges in 1987, and again, we see an increasing uh, amount of activism in the city and the nation indeed also, in just one year later, some activists from ACT UP formed another organization called Queer Nation. Uh, again, this, was, this happened as there was an, a surge of hate crimes committed against the queer community in New York City. We see a rise, a surge in 1990, at least 425 bias-related assaults committed against LGBTQ individuals. In Queer Nation, again formed in 1990, took a confrontational approach. Um, we're not just going to sit back and wait for change and wait for law enforcement, but they staged protests and engaged in other confrontational militant protest style activities. And in Queens, the real turning point took place 
1990. To be specific, July 2nd, 1990, uh, we see the traumatic homophobic murder of Julio Rivera in the neighborhood Jackson Heights. And, um, you know, gay hate crimes, as I mentioned, were disturbingly common, even murders in the 80s and the 1970s, but most weren't thoroughly investigated. Uh, in fact, many times family members felt a sense of shame, stigma, did not uh, make much of an issue to, to law enforcement. Uh, but this one was different. This one, this was a real turning point, a real watershed moment when the family of Julio Rivera um, prodded law enforcement and activists prodded law enforcement to investigate this case as a gay bias murder. In fact, there were three skinheads committed the murder that night, July 2nd, 1990, in a Jackson Heights schoolyard. They were out, quote, hunting homos. They were intoxicated, uh, beat them to death. And again, at first, the police dismissed it as a drug bust gone bad. Um, and there were drug trafficking, there was drug trafficking in the area, or maybe um, a trip gone bad or something. But again, Rivera's Rivera's rel uh, family members and other activists in the anti-violence project, the AVP, prodded uh, law enforcement administration uh, officials during the uh, mayoralty of David Dinkins to do something. And finally, there were arrests and convictions and hate crime legislation was passed. So, you know, we, this is, a, a, again, a real turning point in, in the borough in particular because it's going to lead contribute to uh, an increasing amount of activism in Queens, as well as the formation of organizations, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, the, another major um, development in the city in general was the banning of LGBTQ groups from the St. Patrick's Day Parade in 1991. What had occurred was the Irish lesbian gay organization ILGO for short demanded to march, applied to march in the parade in 1991. Uh, and they would carry their banner. Of course, um, queer individuals had participated in the parade as individuals, but not as an organization um, allowed to carry their banner. And the, the organizers of the parade, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, denied them a permit. Finally, there was a compromise brokered by Mayor David Dinkins said, okay, this group can march, but they're not allowed to carry their banner. Um, this is parade policy. And Mayor Dinkins himself marched with the group in 1991. They were pelted with beer cans, booed and hissed. The Ancient Order of Hibernians officially banned uh, LGBTQ groups from the parade. And it led to some 20, 25 years of civil disobedience. And this is an, an image of individuals getting arrested. For example, 1993, 228 individuals were arrested protesting the exclusion of LGBTQ groups against the St. Patrick's Day Parade. So we're seeing, you know, an increasing like formation of groups um, engaging in, um, uh, in the public protesting exclusion. All of this, let's zoom out for a second from Queens to, um, and, and think about what's occurring in the nation. Remember the culture wars of the early 1990s. Um, and, and one argument I, I've made is that, of course, we know the Cold War ended in 1991. And um, during the Cold War, evangelical Christians often argued that a traditional Christian masculine gender role was essential to the defense of America against effeminate communism. And the Cold War ends around this time and evangelical Christians increasingly shift their focus to domestic issues, to the perceived threats of changing gender roles and sexuality in the nation. And this was really much, very much exemplified by Pat Buchanan's uh, polemical speech at the 1992 Republican National Convention. Remember, this was Bush versus Clinton. Sort of Bush embodies the greatest generation of World War II. Clinton is often portrayed as this symbolic of the 60s counterculture. 
Buchanan talks, um, rails against um, abortion, feminism, gay rights, and ladies and gentlemen, we're in a culture war. And so, you know, of course, this is happening at the national level, an increasing emphasis on, on quote, family values in the political discourse. And it's also happening, again, in New York City, in Queens in particular. In 1992, the New York City Board of Education, and I just led a panel on this at the New York Historical Society on this issue because it's mostly forgotten in 1992, and it's particularly timely against the backdrop of Florida Don't Say Gay. Uh, the New York City Board of Education in 1991 published a 443-page curriculum for first grade teachers. It, would, it wouldn't be mandatory, but it would be uh, suggested. These are lessons for you, a first grade teacher, to incorporate into the classroom. Why do we need this curriculum? Well, it happened, in fact, because of racist incidents in the city in 1989 in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Yusef Hawkins was uh, murdered by a group of white young men. 1986, Howard Beach, Queens, Michael Griffith, a similar uh, racist murder. Uh, you know, div racial division in the city, the Crown Heights riots around this time. So the New York City Board of Education makes the argument that, well, we need to increase tolerance. And to I use the word tolerance because that was the word they used. Um, not respect or acceptance, but tolerance. We need to tolerate different racial groups, different ethnic groups. And um, within the curriculum, and again, it was a multicultural curriculum. It was a multicultural curriculum. There was a unit on the family, on the family. And um, you, again, as a first grade teacher, were encouraged to teach a unit on the family. There are different kinds of family structures. There's the traditional nuclear family there are divorced parents, there are foster parents, there are multi-generational families, sometimes grandparents raise kids, um, and uh, there are working parents. There are also same-sex headed households. And that was what really triggered a firestorm in the city, the idea that um, it was controversial for, for teachers to, to even suggest that they teach students that there could be different kinds of family structures, including same-sex headed households. Um, not only that, there was a suggested readings, a, a bibliography in the curriculum. One of the more, um, the, the one reading, the one thing that people do remember about the Children of the Rainbow curriculum controversy in New York City in 1992 was the, was the suggested book for teachers, Heather Has Two Mommies. Maybe you can see it in the top right by Leslie and Newman. And um, that was one thing. Most people didn't, most critics didn't even read the book, but they just heard the title and just assumed the worst. And, um, and, and District 24 in Queens, District 24 in Queens in particular rejected to adopt the Children of the Rainbow curriculums. And using terms like we don't want our teachers to teach our kids sodomy, deviant sexual behavior, and even worse, and it was a complete distortion of what was actually in the curriculum. I think even gay activists at the time said, you know, we could debate this. We could debate multicultural curriculum. We could have a legitimate debate about it. We could have a legitimate debate. Um, you know, we could talk about different kinds of family structures. And in fact, these diverse family structures reflected the reality of families in New York City and probably the nation at large, too. Um, but, you know, these groups wanted to hold on to this idea of the traditional nuclear family were not willing to permit any, legitimate any other kinds of family structures. But in any case, you know, the criticism completely distorted what was in the curriculum itself. And uh, these, these districts, you can see a map of New York City, the five boroughs here, the ones in black uh, rejected the curriculum because of the mentions of same-sex headed households. So Staten Island. Staten Island was actually its own district. Two districts in Brooklyn. That's District 24 in Queens and a district in the Bronx. Um, and, and there was, I think, significant opposition to the Children of the Rainbow curriculum in New York City from different ethnic racial groups. There were polls done about 50 plus percent whites, 50 percent 
or so um, African Americans, about 40% Latinos, and I think they were rejecting it based on the messages they were hearing um, from the critics. Anyway, this is all the backdrop. Um, there was groups in Queens held a march for truth that, again, we have to correct the lies. We have to correct the distortions in this curriculum. So a march for truth held in Ridgewood, Queens. This is part of District 24. These activists were booed and hissed by folks um, on the sidewalk. So it was actually quite brave for them to march um, in, in District 24 where the opposition to the curriculum was the strongest. And all of this against is the backdrop to the formation of the first Queen's Pride Parade just two months after the March for Truth in June 1993, uh, started by, co-founded by Daniel Drum. Daniel Drum was a teacher in District 24 in Sunnyside, Queens, a fourth grade teacher. He was a gay man, um, still alive, gay man. He had been out to his family since 1973 and friends, but he came out publicly during this controversy, again, which really gripped the New York media. Go back and read the papers in 1992. So many sensational headlines, tabloid coverage, but Drum came out publicly as a gay fourth grade teacher in District 24, where the opposition was strongest, and said, look, enough is enough. You know, we had the murder of Julio Rivera in, in 1990 in the Jackson Heights neighborhood, and now this. We need to promote uh, visibility. Uh, we need to increase awareness and show that many queers live indeed in Queens. And um, he would found, co-found the Queens Pride Parade with fellow activist Maritza Martinez for June 1993. This is part of the, the Drum collection. Drum gave us his papers about five years ago, and I've been researching them, you know, putting on exhibits and, and, um, other pro and working with students and other projects related to the Drum Collection, Queens LGBT. I particularly like this flyer because, you know, as a primary source, I assign it to students. Uh, it really, not just the who, what, when, where, June 6, 1993, Queens, they called it a festival at the time that, taking place in Jackson Heights, 37th Avenue, 14 blocks from 89th Street to 75th Street. But also interesting here, to my earlier point, is who is supporting the formation of a Queens Pride Parade? Many of these groups, hard for you to see, but these are locally based Queens LGBTQ groups. There are also some Manhattan groups. So you can't interpret Queens LGBTQ history in a vacuum, but look at the coalition building that's occurring. Groups forming, um, networking, um, building coalitions. Where did they raise the money for this? It wasn't corporate sponsors like Starbucks, but in fact, they were bringing, Trump tells the story, we were bringing coffee cans into gay bars in Jackson Heights around 10, 11 o'clock at night after people had one or two drinks, not too drunk, but not totally sober. Um, so they're just in the right mood to donate, and we collected money, at, and these are a list of, of gay bars in, lesbian bars in Queens. So you really get a sense this was a DIY, do-it-yourself movement happening at the grassroots, organizing people, raising money, to start a Queen's Pride Parade. Uh, so it's a terrific primary source. And here's an image from the inaugural parade, uh, June 6th, 1993. About 1,000 people marched. There were thousands and thousands of spectators. That's Danny Drum on the right. Jean Manford in the center was um, honorary chair of the parade. She was the founder of the group P Flag, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. She herself had marched in the Manhattan Parade in 1972 with her gay son, Morty Manford, and other parents saw her and admired her support for her own children when it was difficult for them to come to terms with having a queer uh, child. She, she formed the support group PFLAG and was from Queens herself. Flushing was an elementary school teacher. So it was a really pivotal event, um, the, the Queens Pride Parade. 
Just um, a couple of quotes. One, one activist, Brendan Fay, who was, um, who led the opposition to the exclusion of LGBTQ groups from the St. Patrick's Day Parade. He was from Queens. He commented, gays and lesbians should be able to feel comfortable in all parts of the city, not just Manhattan. Guillermo Vasquez, another, uh, another activist from Queens, from the organization Queens Gays and Lesbians United said, it is important to send a message to politicians that there are large numbers of us in Queens. So again, we're seeing the, the formation of coalitions and groups coming together to make themselves visible, to indeed send messages to politicians that we're a significant voting bloc and we're going to coordinate ourselves and press for issues. Um, and what you would then see, and we know the tide, part of the subtitle, the most New York's mo most diverse borough, right? Hundreds and hundreds of languages spoken in Queens. We see the establishment of LGBTQ groups representing different um, ethnic enclaves, ethnic groups in Queens, like Salga, uh, the South As Asian Lesbian and Gay Association, the acronym Salga. Uh, interesting, hard for you to see, but they're carrying signs about the estimated number of cases of HIV AIDS in Nepal, in India, in Pakistan. So it's very much a local community march, but on the other hand, it's global in the sense that the, these groups are using the march as a platform to raise issues in their home countries um, back in South Asia. Las Buenas Amigas. Uh, and, and what's also important, too, about the Queen's movement, why we should study it and write about it and publish about it, is that we see an increasing diversity, too. You think about LGBTQ groups in Manhattan, in Greenwich Village, in Chelsea. It's mostly gay white men, right? But Queens is literally going to change the face of the movement, diversify the movement, because now we have South Asian groups. Now we have Latinas organizing, coming together, marching at the parade. Uh, and again, the parade was quite empowering. Drum talks about this in oral history interviews. It's the perfect place to come out, to feel like you're in the majority. It's not just a parade that's fun and entertaining, though that's part of it, but it's very much empowering. It fosters solidarity. It gives group the, groups the opportunity to network among themselves. To, to come together. Apicha at Queen's Pride, Asian and Pacific Islander Coalition. So um, again, the, the increasing diversity at the, at the parade. And also, as we talk about intersectional identity, groups coming together that historically on the margins of American politics and culture coming together. So gay men against racism. You know, and Drum all often talked about the importance of, you know, bringing together anti-racist groups, feminist groups, queer groups into the coalition. And that's, that's what's going to occur here in Queens in the early 1990s. And again, the broad, broader backdrop here is the expansion of liberalism, right, in New York City, um, that, that groups, even, even those who might have been liberal on issues such as housing, employment, immigration, weren't necessarily liberal on sexual orientation and gender identity, but now they're becoming part of the fold in the broadening liberal coalition in the city. At first, many politicians were reluctant to march in the parade. Drum sent out letters, part of the drum collection at the archives, asking mayors, Congress, um, men and women representing New York City, city council members, many of them said thanks but no thanks. And we, we know they did not want to be visible at the parade at first because they thought it would hurt their chances of re-election. They were political pragmatists. But six, seven years later, by around 2000, you have increasing political support where politicians are jockeying to be in front because they see it as an opportunity to um, you know, to appeal to the LGBTQ community in recognition of their political strength. This is uh, Ruth Messenger, 
Manhattan Borough President at the 1997 parade. In fact, she ran for mayor in 1997, lost in a landslide to Rudolph Giuliani, but this was a, a significant change uh, that, that people like a Manhattan Borough President would become visible at the Queen's Pride Parade when at the, in the first year or so it wasn't the case. More and more business support. So now it's not just about going with a coffee can to gay bars in Queens, um, but there were like local radio stations, Bell Atlantic. Mind you, even to today, it's certainly not a corporate parade. I think people often criticize the Manhattan Pride Parade as being overly corporate, corporations lining up. Um, to try to reach out, to appeal, to brand themselves, to market themselves. Not, not, even today, it's not really the case in Queens, but there was an increase in business support at the Queens Pride Parade. So it's an interesting narrative arc that we're seeing from 1993 to the late 90s, early 2000s. There was always um, an amount of, uh, of backlash at the Queens Pride Parade groups not too many, but cordoned off here to the side where they uh, would, you know, groups protesting. You know, these were some of the individuals who, who undoubtedly were against the Children of the Rainbow curriculum, kind of maybe like remnants of the old Archie Bunker Queens from the 1970s, uh, you know, still, still protesting, but may, not, not too many, maybe 20 or so. That would, would engage in a protest at the, uh, at the parade. Queen's Pride had a rippling effect. Uh, you know, organizers, activists in Brooklyn worked with Danny Drum in Queens and said, you know, we, we ourselves need a Brooklyn Pride parade and it would afford us the opportunity for our community to come together to organize, to celebrate, to be out and proud. And so Queens Pride Parade started in 93. Organizers in Queens worked with organizers in Brooklyn, started the Brooklyn Pride Parade in 1997 in Park Slope, on Fifth Avenue in Park Slope. Bronx Pride started in the late 90s. Uh, so again, the, the rippling effect in the so-called outer boroughs, organizing, and it really, I think, um, like deepens our awareness of New York City. New York City often thought of as a gay-friendly city, uh, but of course there are many neighborhoods, it's not the case. So I think people have to have a more nuanced view of, of particular neighborhoods in the city. Again, culturally conservative neighborhoods where people, um, young queer people feel ostracized or there's still pervasive homophobia. I think people like just think New York City, Stonewall 1969, it's often name checked even in the state of the state address yesterday and, and no, no disrespect to the um, state historian but you know it's often Stonewall is the birthplace um, but you know it's not such a story of linear Progress. Stonewall happens in 1969 in Greenwich Village, and then there's linear progress, but there's often setbacks. And I think by studying the Queen's Pride Parade and what led up to it, we can see it's not a straightforward narrative of progress, but setbacks, pushback, resistance, and so on and so forth. And, and you know, activism and progress is going to happen at different times at different places throughout the city. I mentioned early on that in 1991, the organizers of the St. Patrick's Day Parade, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, banned, officially banned LGBTQ groups after that march with Mayor David Dinkins. Uh, and the subsequent civil disobedience that was occurring, um, individuals protesting, increasing number of politicians were also withdrawing their support from the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And um, not only that, it would be sponsors too. Sponsors like ultimately Guinness. Guinness withdrew support from the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Yeah, right, what a milestone. That would be in the 2000s. And um, it's something I drew, I developed curriculum for college students on the exclusion and, and, and ultimate inclusion 
of groups in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to share it with you. It's on another exhibit that I co-curated. Um, because I see that as sort of like a, the Montgomery bus boycott of the mid-1950s, hit him where it hurts in the pocketbooks. Boycott economic establishments. That's what ultimately happened in the, with the St. Patrick's Day Parade and finally 2015 and 2016 LGBTQ groups were allowed back in. But go back before that in 2000, groups said, look, if we can't march in the parade in Manhattan along Fifth Avenue, we'll start our own parade. So I think it marked the creativity of activists, how resourceful they were. The inaugural St. Pat's for All inclusive parade established in Queens in the neighborhood Sunnyside and Woodside. Uh, in fact, they were historically Irish working class neighborhoods. But by 2000, you know, demographics are changing in Queens, an increasing number of South Asians and Latinos living in these neighborhoods. But uh, 2000 started uh, the inaugural St. Pat's for All by Danny Drum and Brendan Fay. Drum is, is this one here. And then you would have politicians, right, trying to score points, now recognizing that, hey, this could help my candidacy if I indeed, and, and Hillary Clinton at the time was running for a U.S. Senate in the state of New York, appeared. So it's a real milestone, the establishment of St. Pat's for All in Queens in 2000. Finally, uh, in 2009, I'm, I'm going quite forward now, Danny Drum, the teacher from District 24, the fourth grade teacher who um, you know, came out publicly in 1992 against the backdrop of the Children of the Rainbow curriculum controversy, who received hate mail from folks whose job was threatened, though there really wasn't real serious concern that he would lose his job in 1992 for coming out publicly as a gay teacher because he had tenure, he was protected by the union. Uh, but in any case, he did, he did face significant backlash. He also faced a great amount of uh, support, too, I should say this, that in the drum collection, it's really quite moving when Danny came out in, in 92. Um, many of his students wrote him cards. Dear Mr. Drum, we love you. You're our favorite teacher. Um, really, really, you know, we, we think you're the best. You're, and he, in fact, he was winning many awards, too. You know, so this notion that, um, you know, elementary school teachers, gay men and women, um, are recruit, uh, are groomers. These homophobic terms is completely false and distorted. But this was sort of what he was facing at the time in the early 90s. So, but it, it really is poignant to read some of these letters and parents too, supporting, you know, our, my child comes home and tells me how much he loves your class and you're a great teacher. So there was, there was a lot of that, but I think what really marks uh, a, a good end to this talk and, and to this narrative arc is his election to city council in 2009. So he was elected to city council representing the neighborhoods Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, Queens, and he would go on to serve three terms in city council. Uh, again, donated his collection to us about five or six years ago. And it's really helped us reframe the narrative, expand the geographical our geographical understanding of LGBT activism and political organizing coalition building in New York City. So we're grateful and I'm grateful to have this chance to talk a little bit about this subject to you. So thank you very much.